I fondly remember that day, but I don't know if there was any particular occasion. It was nighttime, and my dad just got home from work. He suddenly pulls out this box labeled Family Computer. I'm not referring to a desktop computer at all, but what we know in the West as the Nintendo Entertainment System. Me, my brother, and my mom were all excited to open the box. After what felt like an hour setting it up, what I saw on the TV blew my four-year-old mind. I was astonished that you can control things on the screen. It's a bit ironic considering that the shock I experienced came from a very simple game like Star Force. It is a vertical shoot 'em up made by Tekhan in 1984. The game was from an era where high scores mattered, so there was no ending to it, but every stage got harder. I never reached the Omega target, and I don't plan on doing so. This was the game that was packed in with a console. I barely got to play back then, but it got me hooked. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B-A, start. How can I not include this pop culture reference? Growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, exposed me to a lot of action movies. Stars like Stallone and Arnold were taking the world by storm. As a wee lad, I wanted to be like those larger-than-life heroes. However, I could only live out those dreams by playing Contra. This classic run-and-gun game was made by Konami in 1987. It was one of the few co-op games that we had. I find it weird, but I remember my mom asking stories about this game when I barely had any clue what it was. This is really a fun game, but that waterfall level, ugh. It can really be traumatic, especially if you're playing with a toxic gamer. During my high school years, I would watch one of my good friends who we ironically call Rambo finish the game without 30 lives or any continues. This was before speedruns were even a thing. I still keep in touch with the dude and play with him online when we have the time. Contra is considered by many as a difficult game. I'm proud to say that I was able to beat the game without the Konami code, but with a few continues. I loved playing the Double Dragon series growing up. Even with its limitations, it managed to integrate different fighting techniques into the game. The first one only had a single player mode for the NES, but was still a great game. The sequel changed everything. The controls, visuals, and the addition of co-op made it a must-have. I didn't get to enjoy Part 3 as much because of its difficulty. The franchise got lost in the shuffle around the 16-bit era. I did get to play Neon at a latter time and enjoyed my time with it. Arc System Works surprised me when they recently released Double Dragon Gaiden. It's amazing that some people can't get enough of beat-em-ups even with the changing times. Before MMA, Boxing was the king of fighting sports, and no other man struck fear in the hearts of his opponents like the baddest man on the planet, Iron Mike Tyson. The boxing legend is considered as one of the toughest bosses in video game history. He was the final boss in Nintendo's Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, released in 1987. It tells the story of Lil Mac as he climbs the rankings and fights the man himself. As a kid, the idea of just reaching Tyson gave me goosebumps. It takes time learning the styles of other opponents before players can even step in the ring with him. If you do get to Tyson, you have to survive his vicious uppercuts for a minute and a half just to have a chance at knocking him down. It took me years before I could even beat him without any save states. I actually thought I was good at this game until I saw the speedrun videos. It made me realize I'm not even at that level. I never learned how to do the delay jabs, but 
I still enjoy playing this one at times. The Blue Bomber has been a Capcom staple since 1987. I enjoyed the challenge each game offered for the NES back then. It is a series I'm fond of because of all the memories I've had with the franchise. Part 3 was the first one I got to play. I received it as a graduation present together with Super Mario Bros. 3. I've always had a fun time playing Part 2 and would consider the original to be the hardest. 4 wowed me with its opening intro and 5 felt a bit flat. I borrowed 6 from a friend and finished it over the weekend. I remember my mom saying, you're already in your teens and you're still playing Mega Man when she saw me play 8. Ironically, I was already working when 9 and 10 came out and I still got to finish those. I bought 11 for the Switch but I still haven't tried it out. The Mega Man or Rockman series is like a childhood friend I grew up with. I even had Dr. Wily's Castle 1 from Mega Man 2 as my ringtone for some time. Me and an ex had a laugh when we heard someone else had the same ringtone. I didn't mind that the earlier titles felt like they were rehashing content, since each one provided a fun experience. Capcom also experimented on each title by adding new game mechanics. I'm glad to see that the franchise continues to be a part of video game history by being involved in other titles such as Smash and the other Capcom fighting games. I hope that the iconic franchise continues to provide entertainment for future generations. Not many people in the West played the Tengen version of Tetris for the NES since it was an unlicensed port. What made it a better game compared to the official release is the inclusion of a two-player mode as well as being more visually appealing. It was a bare-bones version of the game, meaning there are no holds and T-spins. This was very popular in my home country and I remember a time when the brick game was a toy everyone played. What piqued my interest in the franchise was my introduction to Tetris Effect. It is responsible for making me a fan and a better player. Tetris 99 is even the first game I downloaded for the Switch. I can proudly say that I have won a Tetris Maximus match in this lifetime. Crossovers always draw people's attention. Whether it's the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Hololive X V Shoujo, or even Alien vs Predator. My very first experience with crossovers was probably the Jetsons meet the Flintstones and mentioning that just made me remember my age. But with video games, I want to share a title which I wish came out in the West. YY World 2 or simply Konami World Part 2, came out in 1991. This ambitious title allowed players to transform into some characters from Konami's beloved franchises. Players start out as either Konami Man or Konami Lady. When they get a specific power-up, they can morph to Simon from Castlevania, Bill from Contra, Goemon from the Mystical Ninja series, Fuma from Getsufu Maden, and Upa, who some people may know as Baby Mario. What made this game stand out was every level offered a different challenge and style of play. I actually didn't own this game, but a neighbor had it. We used to borrow this game a lot from him. Seeing something like this made my imagination go wild, wondering what crossovers we may see in the future. Maybe something like Mega Man vs. Mario vs. Simon. Wait. We already have that game. For some reason though, I can't get into Smash. I would hear this noise echo through the halls of malls, amusement parks, and even restaurants. No other game captured quite an audience like Street Fighter 2, released by Capcom in 1991. The arcades back then were packed with people wanting to play this game. 
I even got to play the Rainbow Edition with some random kid just laughing our asses off, wondering whether the Hadouken or Sonic Boom would win, while we just filled the screen with projectiles. It's one of those titles that I really wanted to have my own copy. We even bought some unlicensed ports of the game for the NES just to compensate for that yearning. I had fun playing the clones with friends, but it does not compare to the original. I finally got it at home when Super Street Fighter 2 came out for the Sega Mega Drive. I played it to the point of getting blistered thumbs, just doing the fireball motion over and over. Compared to the previous games I mentioned, the Street Fighter series allowed players to compete against one another and it serves as a pillar of fighting game history. This was the game for me back then since it featured martial arts and allowed people to fight without the physicality. The iconic series is still going strong with a sixth installment coming out soon. I'd probably pick that one and see if the answer lies in the heart of battle. Developers wanted to capitalize on Street Fighter's popularity in the 90s. Many titles attempted to make their own spin on the genre but failed to capture the same amount of interest. However, one developer took a different approach in presenting their game, implementing digitized sprites and graphic violence to their content catapulted Mortal Kombat to mainstream success. Midway released this title in 1992. It is the game responsible for the creation of the ESRB or the Ratings Board for Games. This beloved long-running series told a better story compared to Street Fighter. This is why Hollywood made numerous movie adaptations of the game. I wasn't really outgoing back then and this game helped me make some friends in school. When I hear some students talk about this title, I wanted to get involved and be a friend to those people. MK2 was actually the title that made me want the Mega Drive for Christmas. The graphics of the older titles made me feel like I was looking at the future, but with how time-consuming the technology was, only a few games featured it. NetherRealm Studios did an awesome job rebooting the franchise. I binge played the MK9 story mode, and MKX actually made me buy a PS4. I don't have MK11 at the moment, but I think it will be a time sink if I ever get into it. The death of Ares is considered by many as groundbreaking. However, I experienced something similar at an earlier time. and. This one hits differently. Fantasy Star 4 for the Sega Mega Drive was released in the US in 1995. It was the first RPG I owned. I have never played the previous sequels but it didn't matter since the game's immersive story already covered everything I needed to know. Its unique sci-fi and anime aesthetic made it stand out. It was a bigger adventure than I expected. Instead of traversing just one world map, players travel to different planets. It was also a treat discovering the different combo attacks each character had. This was actually the game that made me learn about ROMs and emulation. I even tried tweaking the save files. I've finished it numerous times on different platforms, and I still wish there was a way to bring her back. Similar to Ares, it needed to happen from a storyline standpoint. The loss of someone like family is certainly a tough pill to swallow. But we just have to stay strong and move on to deal with it. Chaz just wanted a comfortable life, but he was destined for greater things. The moment he picked up the El Cidian made it clear to him that he was their only hope. In the future, I hope Sega remembers this story and flushes out Alice and Rune's past. Maybe as a different game. I'd certainly tell them to shut up and take my money for that one. It's not a perfect game, there's a number of mistranslations and such. But this one holds a special place in my heart.
I received this game a bit late since I already had a PlayStation when my uncle gave it to me. I still gave it a chance even though it had primitive mechanics. Once I understood how everything worked, it was actually an enjoyable game. Gemfire is a strategy game released by Koei in 1992 for the Sega Mega Drive. The game's objective is to unite the land under one rule and overthrow the current king. Players choose which family to control. Not every family plays the same since each one has a different advantage or disadvantage. The battles play similar to Shining Force while the map mechanics is comparable to the Three Kingdoms series. During my shut in phase, I would play this game the entire time just waiting for each day to be over. It took me around 8 hours to finish it before but now I could finish it in less than 3. I still pick it up and play at times, and I even remember playing it at work before, while we were waiting for the data that we needed. One thing I wish I was able to experience with the game is the two-player mode, since I never got to play an entire campaign with someone else. Video games were transitioning from sprites to polygons. This visual style gave games a more realistic aesthetic and a lot of developers adapted this technology to their products. New game genres emerged, including 3D fighting games. A slew of titles attempted to integrate 3D mechanics into their fighters, but only a few were successful. One of the best 3D fighting games ever made was the Tekken series, released by Namco in 1994. I didn't have much of a history with the original game, Tekken 2 was the first one I played. What I love about the franchise is how easy it is to pick up and play, but difficult to master. Tekken 3 is a far superior game and I have a lot of fun memories with it, but I also have a bone to pick with it. June was my main and you killed her off. I had to learn playing as someone else until Tekken Tag and Tekken 5 came out. Learning that there was a new Kazama character in part 5 made me excited and wanted to have it as soon as possible. Those two games unlocked some life achievements. Tekken Tag was the first game I finished in the arcades on my own, and Tekken 5 made me feel confident in how I play, because it's the first game I finished at the highest difficulty. I actually bought a year-long subscription for Xbox Live because of Tekken 6. Playing it online despite having a bad internet connection helped me become more comfortable playing it with others. I got to bond with some of my old office mates because of Tekken Tag 2. The latest installment, Tekken 7, is a mixed bag for me. I didn't like the addition of rage arts and I also felt that the endings for each character were a bit lackluster. It also featured some questionable DLC, though I did like the addition of the Polish Prime Minister Karateka Lydia. I still love the series, and hope I get to play it with someone again. As a kid, I never understood why there would be a parental guidance warning for shows without any violence or sexual content. I didn't consider that themes and ideologies can alter the perception of children, in the same vein that Suikoden lit the rebellious spirit in me. The game showed me concepts like strength in numbers and the harsh reality that even the people in power can be wrong. The sequel might be a better game, but the struggles of Tyr MacDoll were more relatable to me. Losing his loved ones and the burden of providing an entire continent with a better future was probably not what he signed up for. I can sympathize with his decision to leave after the war and live his own peaceful life. I shared this tale with a cousin when we were younger. I wonder if she still remembers it. I originally tried capturing footage and doing the voiceovers on the fly for this episode, but it proved to me that I need a script to work with. That's why I'm not a streamer. I remember recording myself doing a let's play of Silent Hill HD and decided to scrap it after listening to my commentary. I grew up playing some Castlevania games and I loved them since only a few games had a horror theme back then. 
I specifically enjoyed Bloodlines more than the original. I never expected that the franchise would inspire a new genre with the release of Konami's Castlevania Symphony of the Night. This iconic title came out in 1997. Just like most Castlevania games, your mission is to stop Dracula from wreaking havoc. This is the first game to adapt the Metroidvania style and it also added some RPG elements like equipping different accessories to the game's beloved protagonist, Alucard. It had its share of game-breaking secrets, cheesy dubbing, and an awkward ending song, but I think those are some parts that made the game a classic. It gave people an enjoyable experience, and I think that is the major goal of most games. Similar to Fantasy Star 4, I've finished this one on different platforms numerous times, but felt disappointed with the current release since they rewrote, redubbed, and removed the famous one-liners. This left me with a lingering question. What is a man? The Silent Hill series can be considered as a pioneer of 3D horror games utilizing supernatural elements. What made it different from other survival horrors was its focus on psychological scares and difficult puzzles. The cursed town of Silent Hill has a convoluted history, and every sequel has a different story. The original established the creepiness of the area, while part 2 delved more on how it affects people. It was a pleasant surprise that part 3 was a sequel to the first game. Silent Hill 4 The Room I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Not that room was okay. Let's just hope the franchise can redeem itself in the future. We usually visit relatives for Christmas and New Year when I was younger. When I was in my teen years, I started bringing my console to reunions, hoping that we would have a chance to play something. I didn't expect that one game would bring us all together for one of those occasions. Dance Dance Revolution, released by Konami in 1999, became a global craze. Players need to have a dance pad to get the most out of it. The rhythm game helped players develop a sense of timing by moving to the beat. It is also a good workout. That reunion was one of the few times gaming brought our family together. Everyone was having fun trying it out and dancing along to the music. I treasure that memory and it made me fall in love with the franchise. Once I started getting more into rhythm games, I started playing in the groove for the PlayStation 2 and that game forced me to get good. The strategy that I use when playing DDR now was explained in a tutorial mode of a later game and it allows me to save my energy. I still play it when I see a machine in the arcades. The last time I've had fun with it was with the former co-worker. There was a pet monster craze in the late 90s. A certain yellow electric mouse was taking the world by storm while Bandai released a number of digital monsters. Those two have their own devoted fan base. But something similar in the PlayStation caught my attention. Monster Rancher, released by Tecmo in 1997, allowed players to raise their own monster and compete to be the very best like no one ever was. What made it unique is how the game produces a specific monster from different CDs. It was exciting, just trying to find out what monster each CD contains. I was a fan of the original, but part two is more memorable and a better game. I played it with some classmates, trying my luck against their monsters. We immediately knew something was off when we saw the stats of a certain classmate's golem. 
it was obvious that he used a game shark. It's a device that tinkered with the game files, giving the player an unfair advantage over a game. I obviously had no chance winning against that monstrosity. The franchise may have faded to obscurity, but something reignited my interest in playing the game. Inogami Korode. The VTubing Dogo streamed the game and her bond with Oya Yubi-kun brought back some feels. I actually never finished the game when I was younger, and I finally did during lockdown. When I found out that Koei Tecmo was releasing a remastered version, it became a title I must have because I want revenge. No game sharks allowed this time. The internet was starting to be a necessity for most homes in the late 90s. In those days, a phone line was needed for a connection, and the only way to access the web was by using a desktop computer. This new innovation started online gaming. Though most entries in the series deal with console releases, the influence of home computers back then was undeniable. The platform also had games I wanted to play. One of them was StarCraft's Brood War expansion, released by Blizzard Entertainment in 1998. This strategy game is one of the pioneers of the esports scene. Players choose from three distinct races that have different playstyles. The objective of the game is usually to destroy all of the opposition's bases. I have played the game numerous times with classmates and friends, and each battle had its own story. I'm happy that this iconic title is now free to play though they removed the modem to modem feature. It's understandable why they did this, and I don't think the old landline numbers would still connect me to the people I want to play with. I'm actually scared just trying it out, because the game might tell me, you must construct additional pylons. It was summer and I was in my teens. Instead of spending it summer fancy, I had to be in school to make up for my drafting class. There were only four of us taking the class and there would be days where our instructor wouldn't be around. In those days, we went to a nearby mall to kill time. I remember that day vividly. We were supposed to play Counter-Strike in a cyber cafe, but the place was full, so we decided to go somewhere else. The shop beside the cyber cafe allowed customers to rent a console for a certain time period and play whatever games they had. We decided to stay on that shop and rent a Dreamcast. It was my first time trying out the console and also my first time playing Marvel vs. Capcom 2. The beloved fighting game came out in the year 2000. It featured a stacked roster of 56 playable characters. It had some balancing issues, but offered a very fun experience. When I bought my own Dreamcast for Christmas, I wanted this title in my library. I enjoyed playing it casually. Rambo, however, got hardcore and competitive with the game. Every time it's his turn, we would just drop the controller and do something else. It's a funny and frustrating memory with this game. <laughs> The killer app for the Sega Dreamcast is Namco's Soul Calibur, released in 1998. It's one of the console's launch titles. The home version is way better than the arcade one. The visuals are sharper, and numerous features were added to the renowned fighting game. Being a fan of Soul Edge for the PlayStation, I really wanted to play this game, but had a hard time looking for a copy. When I finally got one, I played it until the disc wore out. I've had memorable matches with friends and classmates, and I even remember the fight counter reaching over 100 on one enjoyable weekend. A feature I miss from the original is the weapon break system since they never brought it back. I think it forced players not to block too much and learn when to land counters. 
The only thing I don't miss from the franchise is playing it with a Dreamcast controller. I've played most games in the series, but still prefer the Dreamcast Classic. Rival Schools is an underrated franchise. Capcom's cult classic came out in 1997. The fighting game had some success since it got a sequel in the year 2000. Project Justice was a Dreamcast exclusive, continuing the story of the original. Players choose from different students and personnel to be part of their three-person team. It had an engaging story mode for every school and faction. The stories had branching paths, which made every playthrough feel different and it also unlocked some characters. We've played the game for hundreds of hours, trying to unlock every character until one day Demon Hyo just decided to unlock himself. I have so many memories playing this title with my high school buddies. We would just play this while munching on chips and just plainly hanging out. It reminds me of the simpler times. I'm glad that Capcom is still showing some love for this franchise by including Akira in Street Fighter V. I definitely want to see this kid's return in a new game. If there was one game I was really looking forward to play for the Dreamcast, it was a system swan song, Shenmue, released in 1999. It was an ambitious title for its time and was even considered to be the most expensive video game developed. It had a simple revenge plot. Players control Ryo Hazuki as he searches for his father's murderer. This game seems to be the ancestor of the current Yakuza games, since both are produced by Sega and have an open world feel. This was another dream game for me, since it featured martial arts, slice of life elements, and even felt that Ryo was a relatable character since I was an awkward teenager. After capturing footage for the game, I can say that this one didn't age well. Controls for the battles are a bit rough and there are too many cutscenes just in the beginning alone. The choreography for the QTE scenes near the end of part 2 were awesome though and some of the models they made were quite attractive. I used to have a big crush on Lee Shoutout. I loved the first two titles, but I felt betrayed when part 3 was released. It took over 18 years for the sequel to come out and it just disappointed me. I wanted progress in the game and story. Instead, I get a filler arc, a dumbed down fighting mechanics, and an unwanted hunger system. I lost interest playing the third one, but still gave the anime a chance. I wasn't expecting much from it, but it was an enjoyable watch. I think I'll be satisfied not getting any new games as long as they continue telling Ryo's tale through the animated series. Era 37! Oh wait, I'm not even playing on a PC. Diablo 3, released for the home consoles in 2013, is an outstanding action RPG. Even though it had a rough start, it persevered and continues to have an active community. What made it addictive to most players is the loot hunting aspect of the game. This is one title that transcended its original lifespan. I originally had it for the 360 but continued playing it on the PS4. I even jokingly told my brother I might get it for the Switch. This is memorable for me because my brother and I had our own 360 units. We would play it in our own separate rooms, but we were together in the game. If we were feeling a bit lazy or had a bad internet connection, we'd play together in one unit. We'd hunt our gear together to the point of falling asleep with the controller still in our hands. Good thing I'm using a whirlwind barbarian. I did play the first two games, but don't have an attachment to it. I'm aware that Immortal came out recently, but I'm not interested in playing games that have a paywall. I hope part 4 will redeem this franchise.
Capcom's biggest franchise is a topic anyone can bring up to start a conversation with fellow gamers. Scary games were a few back then, and Resident Evil set the bar in 1996. A pioneer of the survival horror genre, what's amazing with this series is how each title tries to reinvent its presentation. I love the first game, bad voice acting and all, but the remake revamped that image and made a way scarier game. Everyone who's played the original will always remember the dog jump scare, but the newer version added so many unexpected scares and challenges. As a kid, I tried my best aiming to finish the game under 3 hours to get the rocket launcher. I finally did it when Remake became available on multiple platforms. Originally a GameCube exclusive, this critically acclaimed classic was released for other consoles and the PC in 2014. I've been a fan of the trilogy, Part 4, and even Code Veronica, but not the movies. I'm glad that they added co-op on Part 5 and have memories playing it with a cousin. I also appreciate the direction Capcom took for 7 and 8. I wish I could play the latter titles longer. But sadly, motion sickness gets in the way. Winner of over 100 awards and considered as one of the best PlayStation exclusives, but does it deserve all the accolades? I think it does. The Last of Us is a survival horror game that deals with moral decisions. Naughty Dog's Masterpiece was released in 2013 for the PlayStation 3. The remastered version came out a year later for the PS4. I played it at the time when I was dealing with my own loss. A month before I got the game, me and an ex had an unborn child. I wasn't physically present when she lost it, so I really can't explain what happened. Grief can drive a man crazy. Not everyone will agree with Joel's decision, but I sort of understand his choice. As a horror game, the scares that this game delivers are more realistic. The story is the game's strong point. The only thing I don't like about the game is the camera would sometimes give me motion sickness. I wish I was able to play the online feature included but never had a chance. The ending left me feeling empty, but it managed to be an unforgettable experience. I'm not big on FPS games since I experience motion sickness. The only game I ever finished with a first person perspective was Borderlands 2. I couldn't play it for long periods but what made me stick around aside from enjoying it with my brother was the story and the humor. The sequel is about vault hunters trying to take down a former hunter by the name of Handsome Jack. Once players finish the base game, the different DLCs also offer their own interesting tales. It is a fun multiplayer game and can be addictive to those who like loot hunting. Considered as one of Capcom's bigger titles, Monster Hunter World was released in 2018. It was the first game I played in the series. I got it during a Black Friday sale. I first tried it on my brother's Xbox and immediately felt that it would be a time sink once I start playing. I transitioned from dual blades to longsword to my weapon of choice, the lance. The game feels like a 3D iteration of Punch-Out with action elements and multiplayer. I have spent over 800 hours playing the games. I actually had tears in my eyes when I heard the line, Welcome to your new home. At World's Ending, considering the irony of my situation back then. I got kicked out of my grandma's place. She lied to me about selling the house and wanted me gone after some time. She's the only family I have in the area. I've decided to cut my ties with her ever since. I still consider myself lucky, since the relatives of my stepdad lived nearby. I've been renting one of their rooms since 2019. During the lockdown, Fatalis would eat up the hours as I struggled to take him down. It is probably the hardest boss I've conquered on my own. I was shaking with excitement when I finally heard that victory theme. I'm currently playing Sunbreak and I'm enjoying my time with it. It's one game I play with my old buddies when they're available. Capcom has been a part of my life for some time now. I've had a love-hate relationship with the company. They have won me back with their current hits. It's nice to see that over the years, 
they still provide fans with quality entertainment. I hope that I get to enjoy their new IPs like Exo Primal in the future. All units, level 4 mobilization. Location, Fisk Tower. One show that I would usually watch when I was younger was Spider-Man and Friends. This is how I became more familiar with the Friendly Neighborhood Web Slinger, aside from the 1960s cartoons. My brother is a big Marvel fan, so my knowledge of the brand is limited mostly to what he shares. I did enjoy their shows, but never got into the comics. It is a big surprise to me that I binge played a 2018 PS4 release. This combination of open world mechanics and smooth controls made it easier for players to have an immersive experience. Insomniac Games did an excellent job with both the gameplay and the story. I played it during lockdown, not knowing that it would hit me hard. I just wanted to explore New York as a superhero. Instead, the game mirrored the current reality. Peter's tough decision reminded me of Joel's dilemma in The Last of Us. It showed that making the right decision can be difficult at times. I enjoyed my time with it, but wish they did something else for the stealth sections. It's one of the few games I played until I got the platinum trophy. I didn't expect that Animal Crossing New Horizons would be a game I'd get into. I bought it at the right time since there was nothing going on in my life during that period. I just left my job and this became my escape from reality. It would eat away the hours of my 2022 and was shocked how it managed to take more than 700 hours of my life. The freedom the game offers in designing your own home and island appealed to me. Once I was satisfied with what I made, I was done with it. If it had more online features and allowed me to play with more people, I think I'd still be playing it. <sighs> Yakuza 0, the game that brought me here. I have nothing but good memories of the prequel, but for some odd reason, I couldn't get as invested in the latter titles. I think playing this first raised the bar too high since it is considered by many as one of the best. The game's story focuses on a territorial dispute and a struggle for power within the Yakuza ranks. It is a tale full of twists and turns, but if you want to take a break from the story, the game offers numerous things players can do. It may always be remembered for a meme, but it is a great game. I will continue to support the upcoming games since um, they brought Kason in.